what is the meaning of a scripture in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 11? You might want to turn with me to it. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, a very familiar passage. It's a statement Jesus Christ makes to the church in Philadelphia. And he says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Now, the authorized version, the old King James Bible says, Hold fast what you have, that no man takes your crown. And of course, a crown, obviously a reference to the crown of life, as it's referred to in Revelation 2 and verse 10. You see, in the Greek, the word for no man or no one is medeis, and you can check that out in the Strong's Concordance, number 3367. And it means no man, no woman, no thing, nothing. Now, this can refer to the idea, of course, that we may lose our crown because we become offended by another man, another person. We read in Matthew 24 that many will become offended. Many will even hate one another, will betray one another. And it says the love of many will grow cold. It can also refer to the idea that we mustn't let another man deceive us or beguile us. You find that warning in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6. And the authorized version says here, let no man deceive you with vain or empty words. It's the same word here in the Greek for no man like it is in Revelation. It can also refer to, as I said, the thought that somebody may beguile us, and we shouldn't allow that to happen because in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18, in the authorized version, it says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Or the New King James says, let no one cheat you out of your reward. So these passages, if they went a little bit too fast, you can look at them later. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6 and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18 tell you that. But the warning Christ is giving here in Revelation 3 may also have an additional meaning for us. Because the Good News translation says, hold fast what you have so that no one will seize your crown. Or if I go to the German Good News translation, it says, hold fast what you have because otherwise others will receive your crown. So the warning is, if we don't make it, others will replace us. Now, that is not to be understood, of course, as a selfish desire to exclude others from salvation. But it is a realization that when we are called in this day and age, then today is our only opportunity for salvation. And we are to run in such a way that we win the prize. Now Christ is telling us that when we fail, someone else will replace us. This goes for the church as well. People leave, new people come. Vacant positions will be filled. Notice an interesting example in the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 beginning in verse 15, and I'm reading verses 15 to 26. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. It says, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and altogether the number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. 
And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. It's interesting. We have the number twelve again. But if you go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 14, you read about the New Jerusalem. In Revelation chapter 21 and in verse 14, and notice what it says here, amongst many other things. It says in Revelation 21 and verse 14, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So it's again twelve apostles, but it's not including Judas. Now it's including the one who replaced him. Matthias. You see, the number 12 has to be there, but the one who fell was replaced by another person. And we find replacements in the Bible throughout the Bible many, many times. Let's look at Exodus chapter 32. Now, it didn't happen here because of Moses' intervention, but God was about to do it. God was about to do it. Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. Here the Israelites had just made a golden calf. And, of course, God was extremely angry about that. In Exodus 32 and verse 9, he says to Moses, I have seen this people. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. So God was willing to wipe them all out and to use now Moses and through Moses and his descendants fulfill the promises he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, of course, Moses intervened and told God, please don't do that, and God at that time didn't, but in a replacement still would come, as we will see in a moment. But first, let's think of King Saul. Now, God ordained him to be a king, the first king of Israel. He failed. And so God replaced him with King David. Notice First Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13. And let's look at further 13 and 14 to begin with. First Samuel 13 and verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, verse 14, your kingdom shall not continue. And the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then let's drop down to chapter 15 and find this comment in verses 10 and 11. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. But you see, it was already very late in the game. And of course, it grieves all of us when somebody decides to leave. But nevertheless, look what is happening here in verse 23. 
Here's what Samuel says to Saul. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And then notice in verse 35 of chapter 15, And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. But now, chapter 16 and verse 1, because life goes on. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And then Samuel was sent to anoint King David as king. Now here we have a, an example of quite literally where the crown is taken away from a person to be given to another person. The crown was taken away from King Saul and given to King David. And then later, think of Solomon. You know, Solomon failed. He did not fulfill what God had told him. And so we find that God replaced him with Nathan. If you look at the genealogy of Mary, you see, Mary was a descendant of David, but she was not a descendant of Solomon. She was a descendant of David's other son, Nathan. And you find that in Luke chapter 3 and verse 31. Look at, look at it later. Luke 3 and verse 31. Solomon, in that genealogy, was replaced by Nathan. Christ makes an interesting statement in Matthew chapter 21, in verses 42 and 43. Matthew 21, verses 42 and 43. They said to him, he, I mean, this is Christ talking to the Pharisees, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and leave his vineyard. Do I have the right scripture here now? Yeah, I think I do. And leave his vineyard other, to other wine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in your eyes. Therefore I say to you, verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So it was taken from the physical Israelites. It was given to the spiritual Israelites, the church of God, you and me, if God's spirit dwells in us. But that isn't the end for physical Israel, as it isn't the end for physical Gentiles. Because notice what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 11. And I'm talking about many examples in the Bible where replacements are taking place. Romans 11, beginning at verse 17. Paul is saying in Romans 11, verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And you will say, then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And I'd like you to apply this spiritually. Because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, 
but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. He most certainly is able, but we most certainly must be willing to take God's offer. Think of the 144,000. This is the number of Israelites who will be numbered in Revelation chapter 7. They will be protected from the plagues of the day of the Lord. However, some may still fall away prior to Christ's return. There's no guarantee that all of those who are numbered, 144,000, that these are ex exactly the individuals who are going to be in the first resurrection. Some may still fall away. However, the number must be maintained. And so you later read in Revelation 14, again, about 144,000. Now, is this the same group like it's referred to in Revelation 7? I believe it is, with one caveat. It may not always be exactly the same individuals. Some may fall away. Others will come in. 144,000 will be maintained, you see. So let's make sure that we understand the warning here. The warning is very clear. Treasure your crown. Make sure you don't lose it.